So module 1.2 states and interests in land. This chapter is foundational for a lot of the other areas of the course. So make sure that you know this one well. It's a pretty straightforward chapter. Most students have a pretty easy time of it. So let's get into it. So the first uh, thing sort of about this chapter is the majority of this chapter is about how one person owns property. Uh, and then right at the very end, we're going to talk about how uh, multiple people would own a piece of property. So the first sort of area that you need to know, the first topic you need to know is the major ways that you would own property. What kind of a title ownership do you have? So we have what's called a freehold and the other one is a leasehold. So if you see the phrase fee simple, it means the same thing as freehold. So you can use those interchangeably. So for freehold and leasehold, we say that the freehold is the better way. It's the more valuable way to own property. And the reason for that is because we say that it is a lifetime ownership. So um, it can be passed on to your children. That's what the word inherited means here. So it'll be passed on to whoever is the heir to your estate. For leasehold, that's not the case. For leasehold, you only have that property for the length of the lease that, you, that you've paid for, that you've purchased. Now, for leasehold um, interest in property, it's different than being a tenant. So it's, it's a completely different subject. Being a tenant in a property is not the same as having a leasehold interest in property. For this, it will be for a very, very long time usually. So we have some leases that can be for 99 years. That's kind of the typical number that's thrown around. It can be for more, it can be for less. It just depends on what you've negotiated and what you've actually purchased, um, uh, what you've paid value for. So for the leasehold, a lot of times it'll be uh, government owned properties. So city owned lands or, or federally owned lands. Um, and then a lot of the First Nations lands as well uh, can be a leasehold ownership. So uh, once that lease is done, you actually will either need to negotiate a new leasehold ownership contract uh, or you give that land back to whoever is uh, the ultimate rightful owner. So for the freehold fee simple, this is what we're going to talk about for the majority of the chapter. Uh, we say that it is a lifetime ownership and you can do as you wish for this type of ownership. Uh, and what we mean by that is as long as you follow the laws, you can do what you want with your property. So you can improve it, um, you can live on it, you can use it, whatever the case may be. So um, the ownership here we say is held subject to the Crown's land use regulations. Um, you, can, you can do what you want, but you have to follow the law and you have to respect other people's common law rights. So just because you're a land owner doesn't mean that you can violate other people's rights under the law. Okay, so here you see a, a, a um, uh, an MLS listing that we've gotten for you as an example, and the title to the land here is listed as a freehold ownership. It is a strata property, but it is a freehold uh, fee simple ownership. So why did we have that first slide with the title crown land at the top? If you are the owner of the property, whether it be freehold or leasehold, why did we actually put crown land at the top? And the reason why we have that is because land ownership is ultimately owned by the crown in the province of BC. So um, the government ultimately owns the property and there are a couple of ways that they can actually uh, gain back that ownership of the property. So the first one and the, the one that happens most often, um, now neither of these happens often at all, but this one is definitely more common than the, than the second example. Um, is what we call expropriation. So when the government wants to, to, to use the property for their own purposes, right, they are the ultimate rightful owner of that property, they can take back your property from you if they want to actually use it for something. So a great example of that is if they want to build a sky train or they want to put a highway through, then they will want to expropriate, they'll want to take back that property from you. Now, they technically don't need your permission because they are the rightful owner, right? They're the ultimate rightful owner of all property in this province. However, usually the government will have an obligation to compensate a party if they want to take that property back for their own purposes. 
The other one is kind of a newer type of uh, thing that they've put on and usually it's going to be in your false answer choices. So that's the reason why you need to know what it is. I use this phrase a lot. You need to know what certain things are in order to know what they aren't. Okay. So the doctrine of S cheat is where a fee simple owner of an estate will die without having anybody to actually inherit the property. So they've got no other living relatives. There's no rightful heir to their property. Then it will actually revert back to the crown. So the crown will actually take property ownership uh, back and then it'll be available to be resold again. So again, you need to know what this is in order to know it sort of as a false answer choice. So which of the following is a characteristic of a fee simple estate? So is it held subject to the Crown's land use regulations? That is your true statement. So that is a characteristic. So what's wrong with all of the rest of the answer choices? You need to, to do that. You need to actually reason through all of those answer choices in case they switch this question to which one is not a characteristic. Okay, so it may not be expropriated by the Crown. We know that that is false because it can be taken back, expropriated by the Crown. It is a leasehold. So they're saying, what is a fee simple estate? What's characteristic of a fee simple estate? Fee simple, freehold, and leasehold are two different types of ownership. So it's got nothing to do with characteristics and their, and their um, opposites. And then the common law interest of other individuals cannot exist in conjunction with a fee simple. So this goes back to that point that I was talking about where you need to respect other people's common law rights. So just because you're a landowner doesn't mean that you can uh, violate other people's common law rights. So for this one, the cannot exist is the false part, is the wrong part of that answer choice. Okay, so which of the following statements is false with respect to fee simple estate? So this one is a kind of an opposite question as to the one we just had. So which one is false? A fee simple owner has more rights over his or her land than an owner of any other kind of estate in land. That is a true statement. Remember we said you could do as you wish as long as you followed the law and you respected other people's common law rights. So that one's true. The Land Act allows the government to make further reservations for its benefit over a fee simple estate. So that is to do with the government actually being the rightful ultimate owner of property here in BC. So that one is true. If a fee simple owner dies with no will and no heirs, the property s cheats back to the previous owner of the land or his or her heirs. So they're talking about the previous owner's heirs here in the last part of the, the answer choice. This is your false statement because it would S cheat back to the Crown. It would S cheat back to the government. Okay, so that is your false answer choice. And the Crown is the absolute owner of any fee simple estate. So two and four are kind of referring to the same concept. So that is your false answer. Okay, so freehold fee simple, let's get into a little bit more detail for that one. So when we were doing those questions previously and it was talking about having a will in place, um, this is kind of the details to that. So if you have a will in place, if it's in writing what you actually want to have happen with your property, um, then that is a good situation. That's an ideal situation because you've actually put it in black and white what you want to have done with everything that you own, including your property. So. If it's stated in a will, if it's in writing, then what we say about the people who are going to inherit all of your stuff, including your property, we say that they're the remaindermen of that estate. If it isn't stated in the will, that's less than an ideal situation. You want it to be clear as to what's going to happen. And if you haven't done that, then it's not really understood what you want to have done with all of your stuff. So that is a less than ideal situation. Now, for this one, we say that if there's no will in place, the people who are going to get your stuff are reversioners of your estate. So in both of these situations, as long as you have heirs, they will get your things. Okay, so that, that includes property as well. In this situation, the reason why that we say it's less than ideal is because it will take a lot longer because they'll have to appoint somebody to take care of that and we'll have to figure it out and it just takes a lot more time. If it's clearly stated in a document, in a will, as to what you want done, then this is the best situation because things will happen um, more quickly. 
Okay, so for, for these two, you need to know the title of those people that are going to get the stuff. And the reason why is because UBC will refer to the people as remaindermen or reversioners in the question, and you need to know which situation has a will and which one doesn't. Okay, so let's talk about some estates, some interests um, in land that are actually pretty significant interests. So the first one we're going to talk about is our life estate. So this is the life tenant. So life estate and life tenant, they're talking about the same thing. So a life estate is actually charged onto the title of a property. So it's listed as somebody has this interest in this land. What is a life estate? So let's say that you have an elder, uh, your elderly father and he's uh, 82 years old and he meets this 21 year old lady here. Now she's very attractive and she's also very smart. And she talks your 82-year-old father into giving her a life estate. So what has he given her when he actually writes up that contract and it's charged to the title? Well, he gives her basically the right to use and occupy that property for as long as she lives. That's the reason why it's called a life estate and a life tenant is because it's based on that life, t life tenant's lifetime. It's based on how long they're going to live. So what is the details for this one? It lasts for the lifetime of the holder, like we just said. Um, it can be sold, so you can always sell your, your interest in land, regardless of what kind of an interest it is. It's just certain interests have more value than others. And I'll talk about that in a moment once we get through the details. So what, what rights does she have for this property? She has the right to use and occupy that property for as long as she lives, and she has the right to receive any revenue that might uh, come out of that property. So if there's a business or maybe it's a hobby farm, that kind of thing, if there's any revenue that comes out of that property, she has the right to claim that. Now, if she's going to claim that revenue, then one of her obligations is she has to pay the yearly operational expenses. So usually this will at least be the property taxes, but it might be some other expenses that are related to whatever business is being run um, and wherever that um, uh, revenue comes from. So she has to pay at least the property taxes. She also pays the interest on the mortgage. Now, if there is a mortgage that's remaining on this property, we know from our math section, if you haven't gotten there yet, you'll find this out, we know from our math section that the payments are made up of both principal and interest in a typical mortgage situation. So if she's paying the interest portion of those payments, then who is paying the principal portion? Well, that would be either your remaindermen or your reversioners. So if you have that will in place, the remaindermen would be the ones who would pay that principal. If you don't have a will in place, then the reversioners would be the ones to pay that principal part of the payments. So she has to pay the interest on the mortgage and she is also responsible for something that we call waste. So we'll talk about this in the next few slides. This is a, a legal concept. What about the interest? What about this ability to sell your interest in land? So regardless of what kind of ownership you have, if it's a life tenancy, you can sell that interest. So what if this a lady here, she wanted to sell that life tenancy. So she marries your father, she gets given this life tenancy. As soon as your father dies, she has the right to use and occupy that property for the rest of her life. If she's 21 and when your father dies, she's 25, she's probably going to live for quite a long time. So there's quite a few years that are left in that life tenancy. Well, depending on the amount of years that you might predict that she has left, there's value in that. So if she only has, you know, a five-year projected lifespan, that's less valuable than the 75 years that you think that a 25-year-old may have. So that's what we're talking about. There's, there's interest in that, um, there's value in that interest that she has. So if she were to find somebody that is interested in purchasing this life tenancy from her, if she actually sells her life tenancy to Bob over here, then Bob would actually own that life tenancy interest based on the amount of years that she has left. So it's not based on his life, 
it's based on hers because she is the original life tenant that was granted that life tenancy. So they use this phrase, the estate per autre vie. It's, it's based on the life of. So in, in English, that's what it means. So he would own her life interest based on her life. So if he purchased her life interest and projected that she had 75 years left to live and he paid a sizable amount, you know, a decent amount of money for that, and she died five years later, well, too bad because it's based on her life. If she's now gone, then he loses that life estate interest and then it would go to either the remaindermint or those reversioners. So hopefully that's clear for you. Okay, so what is the waste? What is that uh, talking about? So this is a legal concept. So basically the waste has to do with what happens to the property over time. So if the life tenant has that property, what they do to it and what they don't do to it will actually have an effect on the value of that property. So that's what that waste concept is about. So we have two different um, uh, areas of law that we have these waste classifications under, okay? So we have under the common law, the three that have been around for a very long time, remember, because our common law has been around for a very long time, they're voluntary waste, permissive waste, and ameliorating waste. So what is each of them about? The voluntary waste is you choose to do something to that property and it's probably not going to make a significant difference to the value. So if you want to cut down a tree or pull down a small outbuilding, so you take down a small garage or maybe a workshop, something like that. So the voluntary waste does affect that property and when you do that, when you choose to do those things, you are responsible to the remaindermen and the reversioners um, for that, for those actions. Let's go to the last one here, the ameliorating waste. It's a strange word, but it means that you're improving the property somehow. So in this situation, maybe you would plant a tree or put up a fence. In some cases, you might say, well, if putting in a swimming pool, I would think that that would improve the property. For that one, it kind of depends on the perspective of the people that are eventually going to uh, inherit that property. So for these types of questions, you're going to practice them. You're going to see what UBC thinks is permissive and ameliorating, and, and you're going to have the same opinion as UBC in order to get the questions correct. Okay. What is the middle one? Permissive waste is when you just do nothing. So you allow the property to just deteriorate over time. You just let nature take its course and you don't actually do anything with the property. So um, our life tenant, you know, she, she likes to sit by the pool and, and eat bonbons and have Mai Tais. That's all she does all day. She doesn't do anything. She doesn't fix the roof, but she doesn't do anything destructive to the property either. Now, out of these three categories, sorry, out of these three classifications, there is one classification that you are not going to be responsible to either the remaindermen or the reversioners. And that is your permissive waste. So just think of it this way, permissive, permission, I have permission to do this and I'm not gonna get into trouble. That's the way that I remembered it. Permissive waste, if you take somebody to court and say she did nothing, does that seem like a reasonable thing to bring before a court and say she should be punished for? It's kind of silly when you say it that way. So you're allowed to do nothing. In the other two ca uh, classifications, for those you're going to be responsible to the remaindermen or the reversioners, depending on whether you have a will or not, you're gonna be responsible to those people for the choices that you make. So these three categories, like we said, they've been around for a while, okay? When life was a lot simpler hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Life isn't that simple anymore. So under the statute law, they had to create a new waste classification in order to take into consideration some other stuff, some other events that might happen in these situations. So they created this equitable waste category. So this equitable waste category is when you as a life tenant decide to do something to that property that would significantly change the value of that property. So if you destroyed the main building on that property, so let's say you had a $40 million property in the British properties and you went and rented a backhoe and bulldozed the house. It's, it's now completely demolished. It's just a pile of rubble like this picture. 
if you had a $40 million property, that, that house, that main building might be worth at least several million dollars. So it's going to reduce the value of that property significantly. And like we said, anything that you choose to do, you are responsible to those remaindermint or those reversioners. So for this one, you're, you're responsible if you go ahead and destroy that building. So the equitable waste is sort of a, a later uh, classification. It was created because we have more complicated uh, events that might happen in relation to those interests in land. So hopefully that's clear to you. Now, if when the life estate was granted, your dad said, well, I'm going to give her this life estate and I'm going to say it's without impeachment for waste. So impeachment means responsibility, without responsibility for waste. If that phrase is included in that life estate, then all of those common law classifications are off the list as far as responsibility. So the voluntary and the ameliorating are also not something that the life tenant can be uh, claimed against. So the remainder and reversioners can't go after the life tenant for those. So under, under this phrase here, without impeachment for waste, without responsibility for waste, we get rid of all of those common law categories and the life tenant can do what they want as far as voluntary, permissive, and ameliorating. And remember, permissive waste, you're allowed, you have permission, you're never responsible as a life tenant for that category anyway in the first place. Now, if your dad included the second phrase that we have here, without impeachment for waste, including equitable waste, then it would take off those common law classifications and it would actually take off that equitable waste classification as well. So she wouldn't be responsible for anything that she did to the property, even if she destroyed the main building on the property and its value was significantly affected. So here we go. These are questions sort of based on that information. So Martha dies and leaves her residential property to her daughter, Nicole, as a tenant for life without impeachment for waste. And then to Victoria in a fee simple. So uh, Victoria is going to be the uh, heir of the property eventually. So Nicole leases part of the property to Tiffany for a year. Nicole will most likely be liable to Victoria for which of the following actions. So Nicole is the life tenant. She is responsible to the heir, to either the remainder or the reversioner of that property for the stuff that she does to that property, for the things that she chooses to do. So it's saying she'll be most likely to Victoria for which of the following actions. So it says, as a tenant for life and without impeachment for waste. So that's the key phrase in the sentence. You need to know when it says without impeachment for waste that all of those common law categories are now not the life tenant's responsibility. She's just responsible for that equitable waste category. So for this one, if she refused to uh, forward rent received from Tiffany to Victoria, does she have to do that in the first place? No, because she has the right to use and occupy that property. If she removes the vegetable garden that Victoria loved to install the swimming pool, so would this one be something that she would need to be responsible for? No, because the common law categories are off the table. They're not on the list anymore. If she painted over a mural that Martha has painted on one of the interior walls of the house, is she allowed to do that? Yes, that would be in your um, voluntary waste category. And she's not responsible because we have that without impeachment for waste phrase. What about for demolishing the house after getting into a fight with Victoria and failing to rebuild it? So is she responsible for this one? Yes, she is because it's in that equitable category and that impeachment phrase does not include the equitable category. So she's responsible to Victoria for this one. There were three categories of waste at common law with respect to real property, which one of the following is not one of these categories. So which were the categories under common law? Voluntary, permissive, and ameliorating. So here you have them in two, three, and four. Equitable is under that statute law. So the statute law and the equitable law thing I just wanna address, because I have a lot of students that are confused about this later on, and they, they ask this question. Statute law, when we learned in our previous chapter, in our previous module, we learned that we had three 
sources of law. So we learned that we had statute law, equitable law, and um, our common law. I know it's super confusing, but under the statute law, they created this equitable waste classification. I didn't do that. It wasn't me. I didn't make it up and neither did UBC. Okay. Some lawyers and some law people did a long, long time ago. Please don't get this confused with the statute law source and the equitable law source being the same thing. This has nothing to do with our sources of law. This is to do with our waste classifications, okay? So there's an equitable waste classification that was created under our statute law. So I know it's confusing and it's not ideal, but you've got to get that into your brain. So what was the purpose of statute law in the first place? To make changes, alter, or affect the common law. So that's the reason why this equitable waste classification was created under the statute law was because the common law didn't do a good enough job of protecting the heirs of property when we had life tenancies. So um, hopefully that helps to clear up that situation. Okay, so Cornelius gave a life tenancy to rule which did not expressly state anything about rule's liability for waste. So it says rule will not be liable to the remainderman for what? So there's no phrase, there's no impeachment phrase. It says it doesn't expressly state anything about his liability. So what do we know about it? He's responsible for which ones? The equitable waste, definitely. And in the common law, he's responsible for both the voluntary and the ameliorating. What did we say about the permissive? You're allowed to do nothing. You're permitted to do nothing. So he wouldn't be responsible for that permissive waste classification. Okay, so what other stuff do you have a right to? What other ownership? What other interests are there in property? So um, they say uh, the, the phrase that they use is the extent of ownership in land. So what else has value and what kind of ownership or rights do you have to it? So the three things that they like to commonly uh, say and, and give you questions about are airspace, subsurface rights, and water rights. So there is value in all three of these things, absolutely. But you, as a fee simple freehold owner, which one or which ones do you actually have the ability to say that you have ownership of or the express rights to use it. Only the airspace, okay? So airspace, uh, there is value in airspace, but you're limited to what you can use, not to what you can see, okay? So we can see to the middle of the Milky Way galaxy. It doesn't mean that I have the rights to use that, that airspace all the way uh, to the middle of the Milky Way. It's what you can use. What determines what you can use? your bylaws. So, so it's the laws of the land that determines what your ability is and what your ownership is um, and what your rights are as far as airspace. For subsurface and water rights, those are the government's domain. So we don't have the right to say that we own those. Um, that is the government. So subsurface would be stuff that you would find under ground. So um, any minerals or any precious metals, um, even oil, those kinds of things. And then water is kind of in a separate category. The government always is the one that owns the rights to that, to that water, um, even if it's on your property. Okay, so ownership of land in BC includes not only the surface of the land, but also what else? So you, you have the surface of the land, and what do we mean by that? You have that property, you can do as you wish, you can build on it, you can improve it, you can do all kinds of things to it. So does it also include the column of airspace insofar as the owner can see? So hopefully you see the danger word there. It's insofar as the owner can see, what should it say? What you can use, okay? So that's why that one is a false statement. What about the gold and silver below the land to a depth of 10 feet? Well, that is the government's right. We said subsurface rights are the government's domain. What about any enhancements to the land, whether contractually stated or not? So that is something that you, as a freehold fee simple owner, would have the rights to. So all the enhancements to the land, so the buildings um, and maybe even you know the services that are put onto that property or connected to that property. Petroleum down to the center of the earth. So like I was saying, oil is one of those subsurface rights and the government has the right to that. Okay, so fixtures and chattels. This stuff is actually going to be pretty practical for you to remember. 
um, in your everyday use, um, particularly for real estate agents. So this stuff, keep in your mind, um, this is useful information. So fixtures and chattels, fixtures we say are things that will go with the land. So it runs with the land, it'll, it'll stay with the new owner. So when the seller sells the property, the new owner, that buyer, will become the owner of that thing. So trees, right, improvements, uh, so the buildings on the property, those kinds of things is what it's referring to. So it's something that is put onto that property or affixed to the property in order to better enjoy that property. There is a two-part test that the government has devised. So it's to do with the degree of affixation and the purpose of that affixation. So that's what they mean by the two-part test. So how, how much is it affixed to the property? That's the degree of affixation and what is the reason why it's affixed? So if you see an item that's affixed to the property, then your original presumption Originally, when you look at it, you assume that it is going to be a fixture because it is fixed to the property. But if you look into it and you investigate it a little bit and you notice that, hey, maybe it's, it's not for the purpose of the land, it's not to better enjoy the land, it's actually for the item's purposes, then it may actually be a chattel. So um, there's a question that kind of illustrates what they want you to know and the details that you want uh, to know for this, and you'll see it in a minute. So chattels, those are the objects that remain the personal property of the vendor, the seller. So clothes, you know, their furniture, uh, the car that's in the driveway, those are not the things that are gonna be sold with a property typically, and so those are gonna be the personal property of the vendor. If they are affixed to the property in any way, shape, or form, right, as part of this two-part test, if they are affixed to the property in any way, shape or form, it's for the purpose of actually using that item. So it's not to actually better enjoy the, the property, it's to actually be able to use that item. So, so know the difference between those two because that's kind of the key in, in a lot of the questions and answers. Okay, so a uh, seller has just agreed to sell the house and they're getting ready to move out and they're asking what of these items can she take with her? So can she take her built-in countertop? No, she can't because it's built-in. Countertop is a fixture, okay? So they're, what can she take with her? They're asking which one is a chattel, okay? So not her built-in countertop, that is a fixture. What about her television which is mounted on the wall? So that is the one that she's able to take with her. Laminated flooring, which was just installed two months ago. Nope, the flooring is part of the property, right? It's to better enjoy that property, so that's a fixture. And the expensive faucet in the bathroom. You do need a faucet in the bathroom to get water out of the tap. So no, because this one is fixed in to use that bathroom. Now I'm gonna just clarify something about this television and it being mounted to the wall. You're saying, well, it's mounted to the wall, so it's fixed to the property. So wouldn't that also be a fixture? No, actually it's not. The television usually can be removed from that bracket pretty easily. So that would be the chattel and the bracket that's mounted to the wall would be the fixture. So um, hopefully that is, uh, makes it a little bit more clear. So something that is able to be taken pretty easily, that is something that we say is a chattel. Okay, so which of the following items are found in a house and are considered to be chattels? So the new laminated flooring in the downstairs rooms and hallways, we said laminated flooring, it's put there, it's fixed to the property, it's to better enjoy that property. So this one is not a chattel, that's a fixture. So anything that has A in it can be knocked off the list. So we know that number one is not a possible answer choice. What about B, what about the fridge in the garage? So for this one, yes, the fridge is a chattel, so anything with B is going to be the answer. So four doesn't have B, so we know that we're down 50-50 uh, between two and three. What about wood for the fireplace? Yep, it's not affixed in any way, shape or form. It's usually just stored. So this one definitely. So we now know that the answer is B and C because it's both the fridge and the wood. So the rose bush, so trees, bushes, plants that are that are planted in the ground outside those are considered to be fixtures and not chattels so you shouldn't be taking those with you i just want to clear up one thing about the fridge okay 
a lot of people have confusion about appliances actually whether they're fixtures or chattels and I think the reason why there's a confusion is because most people when they go to purchase a property the appliances are actually included in that sale but if you actually look at the way properties are listed on, on MLS in particular it'll always say on that listing whether those appliances are included or not why is it actually a part of the MLS listing to say that those are included in the sale? Because they're actually chattels. They're, they're in that chattel category, and if you want them to go with that sale, if you're intending for them to be purchased with that property, then as the seller and the agent, the listing agent that's representing the seller, you would actually uh, express that and say, oh, the fridge, the stove, the washer, the dryer, the, those are all going to be part of this sale. So appliances or chattels, right? How are they actually used in the property? Typically they're just plugged in, right? They're just plugged into the wall and they're easily unplugged and taken with them. If it's a built-in oven, right? Then that would actually be a fixture because it is built into that property. Okay, so which of the following statements about fixtures and chattels are false? So where an item is affixed for the enhancement of the use of the premises, that is evidence that the item is a chattel. So look at what they've said here. It's affixed to enhance for the use of the premises. So what did we say that was? We said that's a fixture. If you're trying to better enjoy the land or better enjoy that property, then that's a fixture. And the rest of the answer choice is trying to say that that's a chattel. So that is your false answer choice. So you need to pay attention to all of the other choices because they might actually say which one is true. So where an item is affixed slightly to the premises, it will be considered based on the first impression to be a fixture. So that was part of that two-part test that we've actually learned about where the item is affixed slightly. First impression, it's gonna be a fixture. A chattel is the personal property of the owner. That's a great statement, pretty true. And the test for fixtures and chattels examines the degree of the fixation of an item and the purpose of a fixation of the item. So for this one, that's referring again to that two-part test. Okay, so you see, they've switched it. They're asking now which statement is true. So where an object is affixed to the land for the better use or enjoyment of the object as an object, it will be considered to be a fixture. So. For this one, um, you're thinking, well, that's kind of confusing. I don't know what they're talking about there. I don't even know what they're trying to say. So let's look at some of the other answer choices, right? That's what you would do if you were on your exam. You'd look at some of the other answer choices to see if you could knock a few other answers off the list. So let's look at the bottom one here. To determine whether a piece of property is a fixture or a chattel, the courts have adopted a general three-part test. What do we know about that test? It's a two-part test. So for this one, we know that that is a false answer choice. So that one is not our answer. So articles that are affixed to the land, regardless of how slightly, are, initial, uh, sorry, are initially presumed to be fixtures unless the circumstances show otherwise. So that is part of that two-part test. So for this one, we know that it says regardless of how slightly we're going to originally assume that they're a fixture and then if we investigate then it may turn into a chattel. So for this one, we think maybe, but it says regardless of how slightly. So the degree of a fixed state is a fixation. If you've got something that's barely tacked down or barely screwed down, I think you can probably safely say that that is a chattel. So it's not regardless of how slightly. It's if you think it's a fixed, then you're going to assume that it is a fixture. And if it, on further investigation, if it's affixed to the property, then you're going to think maybe it's a chattel. So we think that this one is false. Items that are fixtures go with the land and will be belong to the purchaser, uh, sorry, the buyer upon completion while chattels remain the personal property of the seller. So that is your true statement. So we said here, so it's, uh, this is re reference to your uh, degree of the fixation. So remember that phrase there. So items that are fixtures go with the land and belong to the purchaser on completion. So for this one, now we know that this one is wrong. So it's, again, it's kind of confusing how they've actually phrased it. 
So if it's for the enjoyment of the object as an object, then that is going to be your chattel. Okay, so we know that that one is a false because it says fixture. So what are some other interests in land that are less than full estate? So less than full ownership. So these are some lesser interests in land. They're, they're still very important. So we still need to be looking for these when we pull title to see if any of these things are on that title. So um, we're gonna go over the easement and restrictive covenant in detail. The profits of Pranda, we're just gonna mention briefly here. So for this one, you just need to know what this is in order to usually identify it as a false answer choice or kind of the opposites in, in a question answer. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So profits of Prandra is when you're allowed to go onto somebody else's property in order to take a profit from it. So good examples of this is if a hunter asks a farmer if they can go hunting on their property, or if you wanna go fishing on somebody's property, um, or maybe you have the rights to take some of uh, a neighbor's crops or use their you know, water well or something like that. So it's just you going in and you're taking a profit from that, um, from that property. So it can be a temporary thing like the hunter on, on the uh, farmer's property or it can be something that's permanent if you have that permanent ability to take a crop every single year. So profits of Prandra, that's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. So we're gonna talk about both the easement and restrictive covenants. These are more significant and these are actually way more common so you'll see these when you actually pull title if you're helping a seller to sell or if you're helping a buyer to buy. So these um, estates, these interests in land, you need to actually release these by an express agreement. So it needs to be clearly stated by both parties that the dominant tenement is going to release that servient tenement and, and everybody knows that that's the situation. So. Um, for these, just because they're still an interest in land, they need to be removed properly. That interest needs to be removed properly. Uh, so interests in land that are less than the states, we're going to talk about the easement. So this is an, a lesser interest in, in property. It's not a full interest. It's not a full estate. The, the first thing that I want to talk about that's super, super important, it's the key for, for this one, is that this easement is actually the benefit of or inflicted on another parcel. So it's the property that actually is the beneficiary of this easement, not the people. So they're going to use specific words. You have to pay attention to the specific words, the descriptive words that they use in order to know whether the answer is true or not. So land, lot, tenement, property, parcel, those are all talking about the property, the, the, the land itself. And those are all okay when we're talking about easements. If they try and use the word um, tenant, person, owner, then those are not uh, correct because it's not the person, it's not the owner, it's not the tenant that is the beneficiary or the, the giver of that easement, okay? so. We have uh, three different characteristics that you need to actually know for the easement. So the first one is that there's a dominant and servient lot. So for, for an easement, you have to have a dominant lot that asks for that easement, that requests or needs that easement. And then you have a servient lot that provides or gives that easement, okay? Uh, the easement itself forms uh, the subject matter of a grant, so it creates boundaries. And I'll talk about that in a little bit when I can show you a picture. And it must accommodate the dominant tenement. Like I just said, you have a dominant tenement, the, the parcel that's asking for an easement from another one. So those are the three characteristics that you need to remember for easement. Okay, so we have this uh, picture here. Now, if we had both of these parcels, so both of these pieces of property, parcel A, parcel B, and this was the only road in this area, and you've got all scrub and bush all the way around, the forest all the way around. How is parcel A going to actually be able to use parcel A? How are they going to be able to access that property? Well, they would ask for this easement, this right of way through parcel B in order to get to parcel A. So in this situation, they might ask you, which is the dominant tenement, right? Not tenant, dominant tenement, which is the dominant tenement and which is the servient tenement. 
So parcel A would be the dominant tenement because it is the one that is requiring parcel B to actually give that easement. Okay, so it has to have a dominant and servient lot. So this is the dominant lot, this is the servient lot. So you would have dominant A that asked for this easement through parcel B. And that makes sense, right? Because otherwise this parcel, this piece of property is, is pretty useless. Now, there are some questions and answers that talk about adjoining properties. Okay, so if we have an easement situation, do the do the parcels, do the properties need to be adjoining? So do they need to be touching? Do they need to be bordering one another? And that is a false statement. You can actually have another parcel that also requires an easement through parcel B in order to enjoy that property, to use that property. So if we had parcel C here, then parcel C would be dominant to both parcel A and parcel B because they would need to have an easement through both to get to parcel C. Okay, so it would be dominant to both of those and both of them would be servient to parcel C. So if it says that you have to be adjacent to or you have to be adjoining, that's a false statement because you can see here by this example that that is not the case. Okay, just wanna throw out there as well, the easement has to make sense. It, there has to be a reason for it. You can't just go and willy-nilly ask for easements on everybody's property. So if you had any of these parcels that were asking for an easement from a property down the street and around the corner, that wouldn't make any sense. There would be no reason for it. And so it more than likely wouldn't be granted or taken seriously. But in this situation, you do need that easement in order to enjoy both parcel A and parcel C. Okay, so in BC, there are three basic requirements for a common law easement. So that was the three characteristics that I mentioned. So which of the following is not a requirement? So the first one says that the easement must be capable of forming the subject matter of a grant. So let's go back. I didn't explain that, <clears throat> so I'll do that. Forming the subject matter of a grant is about creating those boundaries. So this easement here, this right of way, on title, it'll actually have specific boundaries listed. So if you are the, the person who's enjoying, uh, sorry, if you're the parcel that's enjoying this property and you're using this easement to get to your parcel, if you had a $200,000 Ferrari and you were using the easement to get to your property every day and it's you know not the greatest weather and it's mucky and it's gross, and he said, well, this is all muddy and I don't wanna get my Ferrari dirty. So I'm gonna go and drive through the other side here just for a couple weeks until this kind of dries out a little bit. Can you do that? No, you can't. And the reason for that is because the easement itself, right, is the subject matter of that grant. It's you're asking permission for an easement in a certain area. You can't just go drive willy nilly um, through people's property just because it's mucky over in your easement area. So that's what it means by the easement must be capable of forming the subject matter of a grant. It has to have boundaries because you can't just say I have a, a free access to your entire property. That, that, that's not fair to the other parcel. Okay, so um, for this one, we know that it is true. Okay, so the easement must be filed in the land title office to be valid. So we didn't talk about that. So you might not be sure whether it has to be filed or not. So let's keep going, right? That's what you would do on your exam. Three says the easement must accommodate the dominant tenement. So the dominant tenement is the one that's asking for that easement that requires that easement. So yes, it's gonna accommodate that dominant tenement. So that's a true statement. And it says there must be both a dominant and servient tenement. That is also a true statement. For easements, you do have to have both. So for this one, this one is not a requirement. You don't have to have the easement be filed in the land title office and be charged to the title. It can be an agreement between you know, two parcels of land without it actually being filed in the land title office. So the danger word here, the danger phrase is it must be. All right, so the next one that you have that is a, an interest in land that's less than a, an estate is a restrictive covenant. So the trick with this one is how they're going to describe that restrictive covenant. So the, the way that they're gonna trick you is that they'll suggest that you need to use negative words in order to phrase and communicate that restrictive covenant. 
words. And that is actually a false statement. So it doesn't actually have to use those negative words, no, not, never. It just has to be that the restrictive covenant itself, the whole idea of that restrictive covenant is negative in nature. So negative in nature means it is restrictive. That's why it's called a restrictive covenant. So there are a couple of characteristics, sort of requirements, um, that you need to know about restrictive covenants, and then you need to be able to identify which one is the dominant and servient tenement that's involved here. So the three characteristics requirements of restrictive covenant is that it is negative in nature, that it will run with the land. So what that means is it doesn't matter how many times that property changes hands, that restrictive covenant will stick with that property. So it'll stick to that title and stay. And then it is going to be binding on all the parties, covenantee and covenantor. So they're going to use those two words instead of dominant and servient tenement, and you need to be able to know which one is which. So the covenantee is the dominant tenement, and the covenantor is the servient tenement. And the trick to being able to know which one is which for this is in uh, another part of your course in our mortgage lending, we learn that the mortgagee is the lender and the mortgagor is the borrower. How do we know which one is which there? There are two E's in mortgagee and two E's in lender, and then you see that there are two O's in mortgagor and two O's in borrower. Well, it's the same thing with the covenantee and the covenantor. So there are two E's in covenantee, two E's in mortgagee, and that is the dominant party. So that is the dominant tenement in that relationship. And then you have the borrower and the covenantor being the person who owes something, who, who is restricted in this case. So that is a, a good trick to be able to tell those, those two apart. Okay, so what is the deal with a restrictive covenant? What is it all about? Well, if you had ownership of this entire property here, so this whole a square with A and B, let's say you owned that to begin with, and you decided you were going to subdivide the property into two pieces and you were gonna sell this bottom part, the, the, the part that we have uh, designated as B. Well, if you were living on this property and it kind of had a gentle slope down to a water uh, feature and it was a beautiful uh, view of the bay, then you may wanna actually put a restrictive covenant on that new subdivided lot that says that they can't actually build to a certain height or maybe that they can't plant cert certain trees on it so that it doesn't restrict your view and it doesn't actually um, uh, interfere with you being able to enjoy that view. So the restrictive covenant will restrict one parcel, will restrict the other in some way, shape or form. There are all kinds of different restrictive covenants. They won't, they won't ask you for examples, it's just gonna be sort of general characteristics and general questions. Okay, so which of the following statements is false? So number one says, so long as the effect is negative, positive words may be used in the document. So we are talking about a restrictive covenant. It doesn't really say that anywhere, but you need to know sort of the subject matter that's being referred to in the answer choices and figure that out. So that is our true statement, right? We said it needs to be negative in nature. We don't necessarily have to use those negative words. The next one says restrictive covenants must be intended to run with the land. So that was one of the requirements. That was the second one. So yes, it will run with the land regardless of how many times that property will change hands. Number three says a restrictive covenant will be presumed to be released if there has been temporary inconsistency with it. So we haven't talked about that. So if you get that sort of a thing on your exam, you skip it and you move on. Number four says significant changes to the character of a neighborhood may render a restrictive covenant unenforceable. So a lot of students will be stuck kind of 50-50 between these two and they're, they're, they're not really sure which one is true and which one is false. So for this one, that one is the false statement. So if there's a temporary inconsistency, that's temporary is sort of like a short term issue that isn't going to take a restrictive covenant away. It's not going to render it um, unenforceable. Remember we said that that restrictive covenant will run with the land. It will stick to that title. Number four, sorry, we'll go back. Number four is sort of a common sense thing. So you would read this, maybe you've never seen this answer choice before, it's on your exam and you're not really sure what to do with it. Just use your common sense. 
if a neighborhood changes so drastically that the purpose of that restrictive covenant doesn't really make sense anymore, then that restrictive covenant may actually be released from that property. So think of the, the view that we were talking about on that one property, you know, the view of the bay. If it had filled in with sand and there was no view to protect anymore, then the restrictive covenant may not make any sense to have it on um, that property's title. So the next one is a building scheme. So this is actually a group of restrictive covenants. So normally for this one, it is when a builder is building out uh, several properties that they own all at the same time. So uh, the best way to think about this one is strata properties. So when you have a strata property, the building scheme applies to the entire strata. It could actually be for detached homes as well. So if you have a builder developer that is building out uh, three or four different uh, detached homes, single lot uh, homes, then a building scheme, they would have to do that building scheme and it would apply to all of those properties as well. But strata is the most common place that we see this. So again, there are some uh, characteristics, sort of characteristics and requirements that you need to know for this one. This list is a little bit longer. And the reason for that is because there is one specific question where you need to know all of these details in order to figure out the right answer. So the whole point of the, the restrictive covenant is to maintain uniformity. So when a builder is uh, making the plan for that neighborhood or for that strata, um, they come up with that building scheme in order to, to have a sort of general overall building scheme so that it looks nice for that neighborhood. So the requirements that you need to know are that um, all of the parties must receive their title from the same vendor and purchasers may sell to others without affecting the building scheme. So I just want to take a moment and explain this one because this one is the one that comes up in a, a few of the different questions and answer choices. So what this is describing is if you want to have a building scheme, one entity needs to own all of those properties that are part of that building scheme. So you can't have three owners building out six houses and have a building scheme for it. It has to be one owner. So one person or one company that owns all six of those properties that has the building scheme to be in place. So that's what they mean by you have to get the title from the same vendor, from the same seller. It has to be the same entity. And then it doesn't matter how many times those properties get resold. So if you buy from a strata property and it has this building scheme, it doesn't matter if you sell it to someone and then they sell it to someone and then they sell it to someone. Whoever purchases in that strata will, will be subject to this building scheme. So um, you won't affect the building scheme. You won't be able to sort of break the rules or get around it. Okay, the second one is that restrictions will apply equally to all the lots and they're consistent with some general scheme of development. So again, that's about that uniformity. We wanna make sure that everything looks nice and, and everybody's sort of uh, bound by the same rules. And then the benefit of the restrictions should bind each individual lot. So if you have a builder developer that is building out six houses in a, in a detached um, area, they can't have five of them be part of the building scheme and then the one that they want to live in they can't sort of break the rules and have it be different all of those that are part of that builders um, uh, project they need to be bound uh, the same in that building scheme this question this is the one that you need to know everything for so all of that information is kind of jumbled up in this one in the question and answers so it says which of the following is not one of the requirements of a building scheme so not one of the requirements so which one is false? Number one says the initial purchasers must receive their title from the same vendor, although the initial purchasers may then sell to others without affecting the building scheme. So that is true. Like we said, you have to get your title from the same vendor and you can sell to others, but they will still be bound by that building scheme. Number two says the building scheme must be approved by each of the initial purchasers and then enforced against the titles of each of the lots. So this is the one that's false. We don't need the approval of purchasers. Once the developer comes up with that building scheme, they put it in place and it happens regardless of whether the purchasers like it or not. So that means number one is true and number three and four are also true. 
So the vendors must have intended that the benefit of the restriction should bind each individual lot. That is true. And the vendor must have laid out and sold the property subject to restrictions which apply equally to all of the individual lots and which are consistent with some general scheme of development. So this sentence here in number four is a great sort of encapsulation of what the whole point of a building scheme is. So this last little bit here is about how multiple individuals or entities would own property together. So up till now we've been talking about how one person, how one entity would own property and what those interests are. For this we're going to talk about how more than one would own a property together. So there are two different types of co-ownership of land. The first one is, is joint tenancy which is by far the most common way that people own property together. And we have our tenants in common, which is the less common way of owning property together. So I know it's very confusing because of what they're called. Um, we didn't name them that, so don't, don't, don't hold us accountable. But a joint tenancy is by far the, the more common method of owning properties together. So what is joint tenancy all about? Well, <clears throat> It is about owning that property together and having an equal interest in that property. So as soon as you register ownership as a joint tenancy, everybody who is on that title has an equal ownership of that property, whatever the equity is. So what do I mean by that? So if you and your partner want to uh, buy a piece of property, and your partner has $100,000 to put down as a down payment, and you have zero dollars to put down as a down payment, as soon as you register the ownership of you together to own a piece of property, as soon as you register it as a joint tenancy, you, how you have equal ownership in that property, which means you have $50,000 of that equity, and your partner has $50,000 of that equity, regardless of the fact that your partner was the one that provided all $100,000 for that down payment. Okay, so that is the, the deal, that's sort of the, the gist of joint tenancy. So the reason why this is the more common way of owning property is because most of the property that we purchase, we do it with our partners, we do it with family, and so we want to you know, do it the nice way and, and share in that um, equity. So for this one, in order to actually register it as a joint tenancy, you have to meet the four unities. So if you don't meet one out of these four, then you cannot register it as a joint tenancy. So all four of these unities have to be met. So we have the unity of time, the unity of title, <clears throat> the unity of interest, and the unity of possession. So for the first two, they kind of are connected. So the unity of time and unity of title both mean that you have to get your interest at the same time and from the same document. So what does that mean? You put an offer in, both people are wanting to go on to title, you wanna register it as a joint tenancy. And so when you go to do that purchase and you do that real estate transaction, it goes to the lawyer and you fill out all the paperwork together at the same time from the same document. So that's what, that's what the first two are referring to. The third one is the type of interest, the type of ownership. So you, it has to be the same type of ownership. So if you were to go and purchase a property, you wouldn't be able to have one person have a freehold interest and the other person have a leasehold interest. It would both have to be freehold or both have to be leasehold. The last one is the unity of possession, and this one exists with any, any kind of um, property ownership. It just means that you have an undivided interest of the property. What do I mean by that? If you have two people that purchase a piece of property, you can't say that one person owns the front half and the other person owns the back half. It's not how it works. You both own that entire property together with equal interest, right? So whatever your equity is in uh, for that property, that is what you share. Okay, so this one has the right of survivorship that is connected to it. So you have to remember the joint tenancy and the right of survivorship go hand in hand. What is that all about? It means that whoever the joint tenants are, they have a right to everyone else's interest. So if you have four people that are joint tenants and one of them passes away, 
it means this little pinky's interest here goes equally to the other three remaining joint tenants. And then when one of those joint tenants passes away, then that interest for that third joint tenant is now split evenly between those two until there's one survivor left. So that's why we say the last man standing. Once you have the last man standing, then that individual can do whatever they want with that interest, right? They can leave it to their children. They can, uh, you know, sell it, whatever they want to do. So for this joint tenancy, the key to this one is you can't actually will your property to your kids while there are other joint tenants that are surviving you. So as long as there are other joint tenants that are alive still, if you pass away, you can't actually give that property interest to your kids because it's those joint tenants that actually have a right to it under this right of survivorship. Okay, it's very, very important. I know that we kind of get around that with the way that we phrase the, the, the last will and testament if we write that up. Um, but this right of survivorship means that all of those joint tenants actually have a right to your interest in that property. So you have to remember that. With any property interest, you can sell it at any time that you choose. So if you have four joint tenants on a property that, that they own, and one person wants to sell their interest, they can do that. <clears throat> but if that fourth joint tenant were to sell their interest, would that person be able to register as the fourth joint tenant? So they wouldn't because they wouldn't meet the unity of time and that unity of title, right? They wouldn't be getting their title interest at the same time from the same document. So you can always sell your interest, but you can't will it to your kids while those joint tenants are surviving. Once you have that last man standing, right? Last man or last woman standing, then that person can go ahead and will that property to their kids. So for this one, you don't have to have equal money in, but you do have to have equal time in, right? So because that unity of time is saying you have to get your interest at the same time from, the, from that uh, title paperwork. So hopefully that's clear to you. Now, if we had that fourth joint tenant that wanted to sell their interest and just not own this property anymore and they sold to another person, we said this person here that's buying in later on that didn't get their title at the same time as the original joint tenants, if that person wants to actually be put onto title as an owner, they would then need to be put on as our tenants in common. So we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. So which of the following is not a unity required to create a joint tenancy? So we know that it's time, it's title, it's interest and possession. So hopefully you know that disposal is the super easy answer for this one. Okay, so our tenants in common is the other type. This one has only that one unity of possession. So again, for a, a, a tenants in common, if pe people own as tenants in common, you can't say that one person owns the front half and one person owns the back half. And for this one, it actually makes a lot more sense than with the joint tenancy. The joint tenancy we said was an equal ownership, right? You have equal interest in that property no matter what you've contributed to that property. For our tenants in common, your interest, your equity, what right you have to claim on that property depends on what you've actually put into it. So if you are able to come up with more of a down payment than the other people that you're gonna own with for a tenants in common, then you would have a greater interest in that property. So you can have all different kinds of splits as far as percentages for tenants in common. You can have a 99 and 1%, you can have a 25, 75, or you could actually have a 50, 50. Um, anything is possible. Okay. So it just depends on what you put into that property. So you don't have to have equal money or time in the property because you can put a tenant in common on that title later on, long after you've owned that property. For this one, the difference between this and joint tenancy is you can will your interest. And the reason for that is because it's whatever you have a right to. So if you had that 75-25 split and you were the 25, 
then you could actually will your 25% to your kid. You could sell it as well, like we said, remember, you can sell your interest in property anytime, but again, it's what you're limited to, what, whatever your interest is. So if you're the 75-25 and you're that 25, then you could sell your 25%. So if it's not actually specified on the paperwork uh, when you're doing everything through the lawyer, they will err on the side of caution and they will register it as a tenants in common. They won't automatically register it as a joint tenancy. So uh, the joint tenancy actually has to be specified on the paperwork if that's the way that you want to own that property. Okay, so which of the following situations are consistent with the existence of a joint tenancy under current BC law? So this is an A, B, C, D question. You've got your one, two, three, four kind of uh, hiding down here in the corner. So we'll go through each one and, and figure out sort of use our uh, method of elimination to try and get to the answer. So Bert and Ernest are co-owners of White Acre. The front half of the property is Bert's and the back half is owned by Ernest. So it's asking which one is consistent with joint tenancy. So this one is false because Joint tenancy, it's that unity of possession, okay? So you own the entire property together with your equal interest, okay? So that is false. And in fact, I'm gonna say as well, I'll point out that that's actually a false statement for a tenants in common as well. You don't own front and half, or sorry, front and back half. You own whatever your interest is with a tenants in common. So anytime they say this for, for either one, that's gonna be a false statement. So now that we know that this A is false, we can actually cross off number four because it's asking which is consistent, so what is true, and we know that's not one of our answers. So Joan and Anna are co-owners of Greenacre. The document transferring the property to them does not expressly state how they hold the property or what each uh, of their interest is, so what interest each owns. <clears throat> so for this one, this is also a false statement. So if it doesn't expressly state what interest you own, they're going to register it as a tenants in common. So if you weren't sure about this one, which is why we have it in black, if you weren't sure, then you would continue on. But if you knew that this one was false, then you know that the only possible answer is number one, because B is in two, three, and four. So Paul is a co-owner of Blackacre together with Peggy and has transferred his interest in the property to his son and registered the transfer in the land title office. So Paul's son is now a co-owner together with Peggy. So for this one, this one is uh, false. It's not consistent with a joint tenancy because um, you can't actually transfer your interest to somebody else while your joint tenant is actually still alive. So in this case, Paul and Peggy are joint tenants. They're very much alive and healthy and well. And so he wouldn't be able to transfer that to his son. So we know that this one is false. We know that D is the only correct answer. So Herman was a co-owner of Blue Acre. When Herman died, the surviving co-owners of Blue Acre automatically became its only co-owner owners. So this one is describing that right of survivorship. So the next one, Mr. and Mrs. Tom Jones and Ashraf Menzies have signed a contract to purchase and sale for a triplex that's owned by Alan Sinclair. So Mr. and Mrs. Jones have agreed to pay $100,000 each and Ashraf has agreed to pay the balance of $150,000. So they would like their ownership to be registered as a joint tenancy and it asks you which one of the following statements is true. So what do we know about our joint tenancy? We know that we have to meet those four unities. So that is what you're gonna keep in mind when they're talking about joint tenancy and tenancy in common, okay? Especially when they're comparing the two in questions. For this one, they're asking, they wanna, they wanna register it as a joint tenancy, so we have to make sure that we're meeting all four of those unities. And we have, so they're, they're putting the offer in all together at the same time they're gonna get their title interest from the same document. They're gonna have the same ownership. It doesn't say that they, they're gonna have leasehold, freehold. So you assume that it's the same ownership and they have that unity of possession which exists with any type of property ownership. Okay, so, um, so they're wanting to register it as a joint tenancy. We're gonna see which one is true. So Tom, Mrs. Jones and Ashraf cannot register their ownership as a joint tenancy because they did not each contribute the same amount of cash. So for this one, in fact, they actually did contribute the same amount of cash, but that's actually not the reason why this is a, a, a false statement. 
with joint tenancy, it doesn't matter how much cash you contribute. It doesn't matter how much you put into that property. It is always in equal ownership. So it makes no difference how much you have to contribute and what you contribute to the mortgage payments even. Um, it makes no difference. So for that one, that one is a false statement. If their interest is registered as a joint tenancy, Tom, Mrs. Jones, and Ashraf will each own an undivided interest in the triplex. So that one sounds pretty good. We'll see, yep, that one is the one. So this one is talking about your unity of possession. Okay, remember we said you don't own this piece and that piece and, and the other piece separately. It's that you all own that property together. Tom and Mrs. Jones would be allowed to register their interests as a joint tenancy because they're a man and wife, but Ashraf would be a tenant in common with them. So that's not true. It doesn't matter what your relationship is. As long as you meet those four unities, you can register as joint tenants. And then number four says Tom, Mrs. Jones, and Ashraf cannot meet the four common law principles required to create a joint tenancy. And we went over it and said, yes, yes, they can. So um, for both of those, those are false. So that's, uh, that's it.